Okay, it's six o'clock. Let's get started. I do want to mention that I'm concerned about your APA usage. I'm still seeing mistakes. When I see a reference at the end of your paper, I should see citations in your paper. They should be something like author date. That is APA style. I had mentioned this before. A good website for you to go to is the Purdue OWL site for APA. That should help you. Um, I'm also seeing websites put in. Um, if really you should be using journals from the library, but I'm allowing you to use reputable websites. If a website doesn't have a name um, or it doesn't have an author, then it's not a reputable website and you shouldn't be using it. So you should, when you're going to be referencing a website, you should have author date or the name of the website in the date. Or if there's no date that the website's been published, you can put N period D. Um, those are mistakes I'm seeing. I'm also seeing mistakes with the running head. The running head on the first page should say running head, and then the title of the paper in uppercase, and then in the left in the left hand corner, and then in the left hand corner of every page, it should say running head in uppercase. Um, for graduate students, you really know how to do this. Um, you could purchase the APA book. But the Purdue OWL site is so good. If you go to the sample paper, um, you might have to type in sample paper and then it will come up. And you can see what a title page looks like. You'll be able to see the running head in the left hand corner. You'll also be able to see what the reference page looks like. Um, the reference page has a lot of journal articles in it. So why don't you do that? Because you need to be able to know how to use APA correctly. Okay, I'm gonna talk about testing tonight and actually specifically my dissertation, which dealt with testing. Some of you may go on and get a doctorate degree and I highly encourage you to do that. It's a lot of work. I took something like 86 hours, but it was definitely well worth it. I wouldn't be teaching this class for Concordia if I didn't have a doctorate degree. Um, it was a lot of fun writing a dissertation. It was very challenging at times. Um, sometimes I wondered if I was going to get through it, but I made it through it and I defended it and I got it, got it accepted. And I want to talk about it because it deals with testing. And that's the subject of this week's um, class. So I'm going to read you my abstract that, I, that it will give you a summary of what my dissertation was about. The No Child Left Behind legislation was passed in 201 by the United States Congress and signed by President George W. Bush. This legislation mandates by the year 2005-2006, all states must design their own standardized test to be administered to students annually from grades three to 12 to ascertain student achievement, school effectiveness, and denote failing schools. The state of Florida administers a standardized test entitled the Florida Comprehensive Assessment Test, which grades each school in the state from A, schools not, schools making excellent progress to F, schools failing to make excellent progress. The Association for Effective Schools has determined if seven correlates, conditions, are present in the school environment, students are learning, and the school is effective. This research study examines data from the effective school surveys administered to high school teachers at three low-performing schools and three high-performing schools in the state of Florida, which assess teacher perceptions of the implementation of the seven correlates for effective schools into the school environment. Findings from this research indicate that teachers at low and high-performing schools perceive their schools to be equally effective based on the seven correlates of effective schools and do not perceive the difference reflected in the Florida Department of Education's rating system. So the state of Florida rates its schools A to F based on how kids do on one standardized test. It used to be called the FCAT, and now it's called the Florida Assessment Test. And what I did is there is research that say if these seven correlates are in schools, then students should be doing well and the schools are doing well. And the correlates are, let me find the correlates here. The correlates are having a clear school mission. So I asked the teachers to fill out a survey to see if their schools have these correlates. 
having a clear mission, having high expectations for success, frequent monitoring of student progress, opportunity to learn in student time on task, instructional leadership, and safe and orderly environment. And the last one is homeschool environment. I did find a statistically significant difference between, between students, parents, who were involved in the school, in the low-performing school, it was a lot lower, and in the high-performing school, it was a lot higher. And that makes sense. I also found out some interesting facts in the low-performing school. Um, the low-performing school actually said they had a higher safe environment than the high-performing schools. But when you looked at the data, they basically said the same. They said that their schools had these correlates and that their school was performing well with the correlates. But the state of Florida rated them as D or F or A based on the one test. So I asked the teachers to evaluate the schools. So I had um, teachers from six Florida high schools contributed to this research. 87 teachers from three high-performing schools is rated by the state of Florida return surveys. And 163 students from the low-performing school is rated by the state of Florida return surveys. The high-performing schools consist of an urban-suburban school, a suburban school, and a suburban-rural school. When you write a dissertation, you cannot put in the name of the school. Everything is anonymous. These people agree to help you with your research, but they also agree that you will not post their names any place. The low-performing schools consist of three urban schools, one of which is housed in a large metropolitan area, and the other two in mid-sized urban schools. The teachers at the high-performing schools have an average of 16 years experience. The teachers at the low-performing schools had an average of 14 years teaching experience. So the teaching experience is just the same. And like I said, and, and when you write a dissertation, let me backtrack here, you have to have an abstract, which you people have not had to have for your papers in APA style, but as you move along through the program, you might have to use an abstract. You'll see an abstract when you go to the sample paper, you'll see the title page, and then the next page is the abstract. And I just read the abstract in my dissertation to you, and it was about, um, kind of a summary, kind of a, a statement of what my research was about. And then you have a second chapter where you go in and you review all the literature that's been written about your particular subject for um, the last seven or eight years. And um, my second chapter was about 50 pages long. And then the third chapter, you tell how you're going to gather this data. And I kind of gave you a little bit of uh, um, information. I submitted this, this these surveys to teachers, and um, I first had to randomly choose schools. I randomly chose about 10 schools, and I asked them if they would be involved in this because you have to randomly choose. You can't just pick what you want you, so that the, the um, survey will be statistically significant. So the state of Florida has 2,500, 2, 515 public schools that include elementary, middle, and high schools. There are 1,581 elementary schools, 476 middle schools, and 118 combined schools and 340 high schools. And um, there were 48 A schools the year I did this. 67 B schools, 144 C schools, 35 D schools, and 20 F schools. 13 were incomplete and 13 were not previously rated. And so the population for this study that I took, I randomly selected, included the 48 high performing schools and, at the, 40, and the 55 low performing schools. The sample consists of teachers at three randomly chosen high-performing and three randomly chosen low-performing schools. Surveys were sent to 360 teachers at the, the high-performing schools. The respondents to the survey included 87 teachers. 41 teachers returned the surveys from a school employing 125 teachers, that's 32%. Teachers from a school employing 98 teachers, and 17 teachers from a school employing 135 teachers. The overall response rate from the high-performing schools is 25%.
So that's all you can expect to really get. I mean, I'm sure you get phone calls and people ask whether or not um, you will do a survey for them. Well, that's what I was doing. I was asking teachers if they would be involved in my research and do a study on testing. I wanted to see if the low performing schools were doing what they needed to do and what was the difference? Why were some rated A by the state of Florida and why were some rated F? And so I talked about the second chapter and I talked about the third chapter. The third chapter is where you write about what you're gonna do and how you're going to do it. And I wrote about how I would ask the high school principals at a staff meeting to give out the surveys. Everything was anonymous and um, to put the surveys in a stamped envelope that I provided and send them back to me at the university. I actually had to go, I got this in 204, I took a sabbatical and I went to the university when I was writing my dissertation so I could be on campus and work with my professors. There were 111 questions in the survey. And so you can see why some teachers were hesitant to do it. I mean, sometimes I do surveys over the phone, and sometimes I say, no, um, I'm just not in the mood, I don't wanna do it. But I do try to do more surveys, because I know how I felt when I was doing my dissertation. I wanted schools to respond to my survey so I could do my dissertation and graduate and get my doctorate degree. So I told you the results, results of the thing, and I'm gonna read the last chapter to you because this tells why the discussion of the research, why I felt when I analyzed, and that's what you do in the last chapter, the fourth chapter, you tell what the results are. The third chapter, you tell how you're gonna do it. The fourth chapter, you tell what the results are. And the fifth chapter, you write about why you think the results were a certain way. The state of Florida rates its schools H to F based on the Florida Comprehensive Achievement Test. Teachers at high A and low D or F schools were asked to evaluate their schools using the more effective school survey, school staff survey. Teachers' ratings at low and high performing schools were compared in reviewing the data and findings based on the research question in this study. One can conclude that teachers at the low performing and high performing schools rate their schools in a similar fashion and do not perceive the differences that the state of Florida perceives in regard to school effectiveness. Effective schools correlates as a function of student learning. Data analysis indicates that teachers surveyed at high and low performing schools seem to agree more than they disagree. The means for all the respondents to the questions are above 3.4 on a scale of five. The teachers at both schools rate the correlates frequent monitoring of student progress and high expectations for success um, the highest. The only two correlates I disagree on are homeschool environment versus safe and orderly climate. The high performing schools rate their schools higher in homeschool environment. More parents are participating in the high performing schools and the low performing schools rate their schools higher in safe and orderly climate. And that's what I just told you a few minutes ago. The correlates clear school mission, opportunity to learn and student time on task and instructional leadership are rated in a similar fashion with the mean between 3.6 and 3.8. Based on these findings, the teachers seem to believe that the low performing and high performing schools are safe, have a clear school mission, high expectations for success, monitor their students' progress frequently, have strong instructional leadership, a two-way communication between parents and the school exists and students are given an opportunity to learn with the proper amount of time allocated for this to occur. The Association for Effective Schools involved in the development of the survey used to ascertain school effectiveness was created out of belief that schools do make a difference in the learning ability of children. Prior to 1966, there was the belief that students raised in poverty would not be able to learn the curriculum. The effective schools research disputed this belief by studying schools in which students were learning and succeeding in academic pursuits. The characteristics of these successful schools were documented 
the school culture was scrutinized with a focus on how the philosophical beliefs and educational policies impacted student learning in a positive way. The characteristics these schools shared in common became known as the effective schools correlates. These correlates have evolved as society has changed its thinking on what to expect from an educational community. It is believed that the correlates affect student learning in a positive way. The teachers at three low performing and three high performing schools in the state of Florida evaluate their schools as equally effective based on this body of research. Similarities between low and high performing school on data. Of the seven correlates of effective schools as reflected in the hypotheses of this research and included in the research questions, the teachers participating in this study rate five of the correlates in a similar manner with a mean above 3.6. The first of the five correlates rated similarly pertains to teacher perceptions of instructional leadership, which includes teachers and administrators. According to the data collected and analyzed, the teachers at the low and high performing schools both feel that their schools create an environment where teachers and administrators can be involved in the teaching in the leadership positions. The teachers believe that the principal is highly visible throughout the school, is a strong instructional leader, a resource person, and supports teachers' efforts. They also believe that staff members are encouraged to work together and share ideas, that the principal demonstrates collaborative behavior with the teachers, and the teachers are provided with a wide variety of instructional material. According to Costner and Peterson, at the end of 1970s and the beginning of the 1980s, behaviors were documented that defined instructional leadership and its contribution to student learning. These behaviors were first said to pertain only to administrators. Eventually, the perception changed and teachers were included in the definition of good instructional leadership. Successful schools have a shared sense of purpose with the entire instructional faculty contributing to the learning of the students. Furthermore, this environment encourages collaboration among teachers and sharing of ideas. The principal models good instructional leadership, nurtures staff leadership, and creates an atmosphere where all teachers can share in leading their colleagues. Clear and focused mission is a second correlate listed in a similar manner to be discussed. The teachers at both the high and low performing schools rate their schools high. They believe that the school has a mission and the mission promotes the school's academic goals. They believe that student learning objectives are developed cooperatively by the staff and the focus at the school is learning for all. Also included in this correlate, the responding teachers at the school surveyed to ascertain that student learning considerations are the most important criteria when making decisions and students and staff respect individual differences within the school body. There is a belief that students work to provide an atmosphere where self-esteem to develop is developed in the students in addition the teachers are in agreement with their school mission which is clearly written, adhered to, and serves as a basis for important decisions and acts in spite of frustration and obstacles encountered. John Goodlad suggests that schools take on a special significance because they and they alone were created to ensure that a deliberate, systematic, sustained process of educating would go into our country. Deming, who developed the philosophy of total quality management, emphasizes creating consistency of purpose toward improvement of product and service. This means that all people involved in a work environment are working toward a shared purpose, and this purpose is internalized by all. The correlate high expectations for success will be discussed now in his third correlated, correlate, rated by the teachers as similar. The teacher survey responded that teachers at their schools have high expectations for all students and do not behave differently toward students based on preconceived assumptions. These teachers believe that all students are encouraged to develop responsibility for completing assigned work in a timely manner, that high expectations are communicated to all students regardless of gender, race, socioeconomic status, or other personal characteristics, and that the school systematically and publicly recognizes students who improve and succeed academically. They hold the belief that the faculty is committed to the task of helping students master important learning objectives, and the faculty holds high expectations for themselves as well as students. If a school exhibits an atmosphere where teachers believe that all students can learn, then it is believed that students will rise to the occasion. Students perform better when teachers expect that they can master the material and have expectations in this regard. Several researchers have shown 
The teacher expectations play a major role in determining how much students can master and learn. Students have a tendency to internalize the belief their teachers have about them. When teachers see them as lacking in innate ability or drive, students may come to perceive themselves in this way. Beliefs that teachers have about their students can become self-fulfilling prophecies, where students give back to student teachers just what they expect from them. Students may come to believe that their effort and persistence will not positively affect their learning capacity if they internalize negative teacher perceptions about their ability to learn. With regard to the correlate, correlate opportunity to learn and time on task, the fourth correlate, the teachers in the sample again rated the schools favorably at both the low and high performing schools. These teachers have faith that learning activities are productive through careful participation, active supervision, and provision of assistance to students in such a way that others are not disturbed. Students are allowed the time, help, and encouragement necessary to achieve desired results. Teachers also have a sense that students are given sufficient time to practice and consolidate new instructional skills, and that the classroom is managed in such a way to keep disruptive behavior at a minimum. There's the belief that students have the opportunity to relate learning across subjects through interdisciplinary learning experiences. The multiple methods of teaching are used to ensure learning success for all, and that analysis and discussion of test content are part of periodic curricular reviews. Schools that are successful make sure that there are favorable conditions which allow the students to be engaged in learning activities that give them the time necessary to assimilate the material presented. Different methods are used to instruct students. Time is used efficiently and lessons are chosen carefully. The last correlate to be discussed is the fifth correlate in which the teachers at both the low and high performing school rate their schools in a similar manner. The correlate is frequent monitoring of student progress. Teachers at both the low and high performing school perceive their students to be in a place where students are taught to monitor their own progress. The staff collects and reviews performance data to ensure early identification and treatment of children with learning disabilities, and students are monitored continuously for their rate of learning. In addition, these teachers believe that through their monitoring process, teachers become aware of students having academic difficulty and problems are noted and appropriate help is provided. Gippen Fox, 1991, state that the school curriculum is to be effective, an assessment process needs to be undertaken. This assessment process should include a determination of the comprehensive needs of the school and students. Included in this assessment is an investigation of achievement scores, dropout rates, daily attendance, and educational needs. Okay, and I told you that there was a difference between home and school. Um, and the difference can be traced to the stability rate calculated by the Department of Education. And so there was much more high stability rate, meaning that you didn't have as many migrant kids attending the, the, the high performing schools um, and at the low performing schools you had a high level of migrant students and I know I had one migrant student in sixth grade who was a wonderful student who came back to me at the end of the year and was very perplexed had been to through two or three different schools because his parents moved and he was not the student that he was at the beginning of the year um, he couldn't catch up with us um, I was very frustrated and it was because he had been to two or three different schools during the school year. Um, it is also important to note that as children mature, parents tend to return to work, especially parents that need the income afforded by employment. Society does not have a partnership with schools, allowing parents flexible time to become involved in the children's education. So my supposition was that a lot of these parents are working and they don't have the time to become involved in their parents' schools. And the low performing schools rate their schools higher in safe and orderly environment. The principal can alert the support staff when things need to be fixed to make sure the request is followed through. The teachers also said the discipline is clearly linked to a student's inappropriate behavior rather than personality, and that the resolution of discipline issues involves administrators, teachers, students, and parents. One can speculate that the low performing schools and emphasis on consistency and discipline issues can be agreed upon by staff and carried out immediately while trying to work on increasing test scores. More cohesion is needed at low performing schools to support academic performance. The high performing schools are doing well on test scores, so there is less need for consistency and more room for autonomy. 
In addition, it is possible that the low performing schools may be providing a safe haven for students. The home environment may not be as safe and orderly as the environment the students find at school. The school may be serving as the home away from home. And when you become a researcher and you get to the fifth chapter, you can, you have to back it up by research, but you can have some of your own thoughts as to why something like this may have occurred. The testing movement will not work when the child's first language is not English. And so I found at the low performing schools that they had a higher rate of students who were not English speaking students. They were ELL students. So when they take the, the, the end of the year test, of course they're not able to do as well as students who have English as their first language. So that was one of the things that I found. Even though the correlates were there at the low performing schools, the students were a lot higher um, ELL students than at the high performing schools. Florida has a large Hispanic American culture and sometimes these students and their families have a complicated and trying relationship with public schools. More Latinos attend schools that have a high poverty level. Students in poor neighborhoods and are brought up with the first language other than English will start school with a smaller vocabulary and less familiarity with English letters and numbers, which can translate into more difficulty with reading. These children spend a considerable amount of time trying to make up for their lack of skills. And we passed um, an amendment in the state of Florida in 1988 saying English is the official language. The Bilingual Education Act was passed, which stresses using federal funds only for student English language acquisition. Um, we are moving to the direction of English being the dominant language with other languages left by the wayside. And this may result that bilingual students are at a disadvantage because their native language and culture are dismissed in the educational environment. They may be having a negative effect on students in bridging knowledge acquired at home with the learning at school. Using only standard English may separate some students from their extended family where the native language dominates cultural activities and family life. Furthermore, students learn a second language best when they can build on their first language. So in Broward County, there were 1,500 students that didn't pass the test. And quite a few of these students were from minority groups such as Hispanic, Latino, and Cuban, where the dominant family language is not English. In addition, a majority of these students are from low-income areas with a higher teacher turnout and less money for enrichment classes. People in the minority communities banded together to fight this decision with students walking out of class in protest. Some of these students have athletic scholarships and have been accepted by colleges or community colleges. The people in protest point out that 25% more students failed the FCAT test than failed the high school comprehensive test given the previous year. Also, there is the belief that students have not been taught to the FCAT test for a long enough period of time. I don't know, I taught for 31, 32 years. And my last few years of teaching, I spent teaching to the test so that my students could pass the comprehensive test. And um, I know a lot of teachers teach to the test. I did do other things, of course, but I wanted to make sure that my students passed the test. The state of Florida rates its high schools on the FCAT test. It's high schools on the FCAT test, which is given to students in 10th grade. Students are then assigned a grade level based on, based on student performance. School performance grades are based on a combination of student achievement scores on writing, reading, and mathematics in 10th grade. Also included are annual student learning games as measured by reading and mathematics assessment in grade 10, and improvement on the FCAT reading scores in the lowest 2.5% of students. Schools that receive a performance grade of 410 points receive an A, 380 points of B, 320 points of C, 280 points of D, and fewer than 280 points in F. So I just kind of gave you an overview of my dissertation and testing. And um, we do find that schools now, there's been a lot more research since uh, I did this in 2004, and we're finding that high poverty schools have lower test scores. And it could be because of some of the reasons that I mentioned. They have high minority students. They have schools coming, students coming from poverty. Um, education isn't stressed as much. Um, parents aren't helping their students with their homework at night. I know I have four grandsons, two are older, but the other two are younger. And the parents help them every night with their homework. They have to do this. And so um, 
This is a little bit about dissertation. It has to do with testing, and that's what we're talking about this week. If you have any questions, please let me know. And um, good night to everybody, and I'm going to stop the recording now. Um, you know how to get in touch with me. Please get in touch with me if you need to.